Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Michael Newman. I'm the Chief Executive of the Association of Jewish Refugees, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this special event this evening where we will be bringing another fascinating instalment and offering from Insiders Outsiders, uh, a partnership that the AJR has been delighted to develop uh, in the last couple of years. And this event is brought to you in addition to uh, insiders and outsiders and the AJR uh, in conjunction also with the embassy, the, the German embassy in London. So welcome everybody. It's fantastic to uh, see you all. For those of you who don't know about the AJR, we represent and support Holocaust refugees and survivors living in Britain and something particularly important, especially at this time. And if you are aware of anybody who could benefit from our special services, then please do let us know. Please do make contact with us. Uh, we are, in addition to uh, as a charity offering that support and advice and guidance, we also have a team of social workers who travel the country uh, offering practical assistance and a team of volunteers who support and supplement that work. And we're also a grant making organization supporting Holocaust education and memorialization. And this evening, it's, I think, particularly resonant for many of our members, because, of course, many of them came from Germany and particularly from Berlin. So it's nice to be at least virtually in Berlin this evening uh, and to hear about this exciting project. I had the privilege of meeting colleagues uh, behind the project who we're going to hear from this evening. Uh, in in Berlin last summer, summer of 2019, which seems longer than 18 months ago, somehow a different lifetime. Uh, and it's great that they're available this evening to uh, present information about the project. And it comes also at a special time for the AJR ahead of our 80th anniversary next year, where we are delighted to capture the culture, the heritage, the history and traditions of uh, the Jewish refugees who came from Germany and of course Ger uh, Berlin and especially a project like the Exile Museum uh, has particular resonance. So shortly uh, you will hear from those making the presentation but I'd first like to introduce Andrea Hamel who will be chairing this evening's event. Uh, Andrea is a long-standing colleague of the AJRs, uh, and she's a reader in German at Aberystwyth uh, University in Wales. Having studied literature and sociology at Essex University, she completed uh, an MA in comparative literature and an MA in German Jewish studies at Sussex University. Uh, then she worked at the Centre for German Jewish Studies at Sussex before taking up the position at Aberystwyth 10 years ago. She's organized and co-organized numerous conferences and published widely on refugees from national socialism in the UK. She's a member of the Bayreuth and the Gesellschaft for Exilforschung, a member of the Research Center for German and Austrian Studies, and the director of the Center for the Movement of People. Uh, she was also one of uh, uh, the members of the German-British Consortium. We worked on the exhibition Am Ende des Tunnels, the Kindertransport 1938-39 aus Berlin, shown in Berlin last year and now traveling across Germany. And uh, she's one of the co-curators of the exhibition on Kinder Emigration to be opened at the Deutsche Bibliothek in Frankfurt uh, in May next year. Her project Refugees from National Socialism in Midwest and North Wales is part of the Second World War and Holocaust Partnership Program led by the Imperial War Museum in London and funded by the National Lottery Fund. So I hope you all have a fascinating uh, and illuminating evening. And I will hand over now to Andrea to chair and moderate proceedings. Thank you. So thank you very much for the kind words of introduction. Um, Michael, I'm very pleased to be asked to chair this event today. And I don't want to waste any time. So I will introduce the two speakers now. Uh, and they will speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and there will be plenty of time for questions. So the first speaker is Ruth Ur, who is a member of the four-person board of the Exil Museum. 
Um, Ruth worked for the British Council and held several senior leadership positions in uh, including diplomatic postings, uh, including uh, postings as the cultural attache to Israel and to Turkey. And she later set up new departments such as the Department of Arts and Development. Um, uh, very interestingly, Ruth curated the first ever artwork to cover the entire facade of Buckingham Palace. And she was also the curator of the British Pavilion of the Viennese, um, of the Venice Biennale in 2002. Um, Ruth is the director of Yad Vashem in German speaking lands. And uh, she will speak today uh, uh, and she will start off proceedings. And the second speaker will be Cornelia Fossen. Cornelia Fossen is uh, the curator of the EXA Museum. Um, she has 25 years of experience of curating content for media and exhibitions. Um, her special expertise is in the scenography of space and especially working with large multimedia installations. And I'm sure we will hear more about that. I'm uh, uh, very keen to learn more. And she has worked on multimedia guides uh, uh, with focus on the Berlin Wall, for example, or with uh, digital future space for the Ludwig Erheit Center. So I'm passing uh, uh, the the microphone, I suppose, I'm passing the microphone over to uh, Ruth and Cornelia now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Can you hear me okay? Great. Thank you for that lovely introduction and um, to Michael and Monica for inviting us to this event today. Um, so the way that we're going to do it is um, I'm going to kick off with some background on the Exilium Museum how it all came about, some of the protagonists behind it and why we think it's important. And then I'll pass over to Cornelia who will talk about the conceptual aspects of it and um, give you a sense of what is being planned. I'm also really happy that we have Maika Marie Tila on the line with us, who's the managing director of the museum and she will be around to answer questions at the end. So shall we put on the so, um, first slides? Okay, so I'm going to start with this slide. I don't know how many of you recognize this face or recognize the name. I hope you do. It's Hertha Muller, uh, the Romanian born German novelist, poet, essayist, and recipient of the 2009 Nobel Prize for Literature. She was born in Timiș County in Romania, and her native language is German. In 1987, she emigrated to West Germany. And her works have since then been translated into over 20 languages. And her work is noted for depicting the effects of violence, cruelty, and terror, usually in the setting of Ceausescu's Romania, uh, which she experienced herself. And many of her works are told from the viewpoint of the German minority in Romania. Um, she's the recipient of numerous literary awards, including the Franz Werfel Human Rights Award in 2009. Upon being awarded the Nobel Prize, the Swedish Academy described Hertha Muller as a woman who, with the concentration of poetry and the frankness of prose, depicts the landscape of the dispossessed. Now, you might be asking, why do I start with Hertha Muller? And you will now see because in 2011, Hertha Muller wrote an open letter to the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, arguing for the need for a mu museum of exile. And this is what she wrote. Today, there are many different branches of exile research, but there is no center where the heterogeneous experiences of exile as part of German history can be vividly demonstrated. Therefore, I ask you to do everything you can to make a place possible in Germany, where the experiences of exile can be remembered with dignity, a place where biographies linked to exile can be told. So this was the starting idea or the starting point for the idea of a place devoted to the telling of individual stories of exile from Germany and German speaking lands. 
Now, um, you'll see the slide here. Of course, you'll recognize some of these uh, familiar faces, maybe others you won't. Um, the, the idea here is to capture some of these stories and experiences of both famous and less famous um, uh, and people who experienced exile. Of course, there is an incredible wealth of literature on this subject, countless biographies and books, including notably Daniel Snowman's wonderful book, Hitler Emigres, and I think that Daniel's with us today, which is great. Our question is, and the and Hetta Muller's call to action is, how do we share these stories, these complex stories with a wider audience? And that is the impetus for the Exile Museum, and I think also for the wonderful Insider Outsider Festival that Monica initiated. Exile Museum, more urgent today than ever before. Um, I'm really not a fan of having comparative photographs, um, but I feel that in this case it is justified. Um, I think that um, when the um, subject or the idea of having an exile museum came up, when it began uh, with Herta Muller's call to action, um, it was it had a different flavor than it does now. It was more of a, a more of a way of, of of telling a historical story. And of course, in the last, um, in the last few years, since the huge um, story of migration, forced migration, refugee crisis, um, this has obviously taken on a different complexion, this story of exile, particularly as populist and right-wing parties in Germany and elsewhere, not only try to discredit the way that remembered the past, but also, um, insight against refugees who seek refuge in Germany and elsewhere in Europe today. So by remembering those who are forced to make their lives elsewhere, the planned museum can remind us of the importance of tolerance, humanity and empathy for people who have lost or had to leave their homes due to persecution. I'm not sure whether Muller ever actually received a reply from the Chancellor, <laughs> but as Merkel's chancellorship is drawing to an end, if there is one thing that Merkel will be remembered for, it was her response to the global refugee crisis. So why a museum devoted to exile? So obviously this was one of the questions that came up you know, right from the beginning. Um, of course, there are many, many, many museums, both with even in Berlin, in Germany, in Europe, internationally, who tell the story of, who, who, who have a component or an important part that tells the story of exile. The impetus for this project was though that it's usually treated as a secondary theme and it doesn't have a central place in, in museums that, that talk about whether it's Jewish history or, um, or the Holocaust. Of course, there's the exile archive at the National Library of Frankfurt, which you can see on the right hand side. Um, but, and, and even there, of course, there's a limit of how many stories you can tell. Um, so the idea with this, with the Exile Museum that we're planning is that it will complete um, a picture that many institutions um, have created, but this will bring another dimension to it. So protagonists, I think this is always interesting to hear who are the people behind the scenes who are making this happen. And I've called it realizing Herta Muller's call to action. So here's Herta Muller herself, once again, a different photo, full of as an animated photo. And um, here she is not as, um, as a famous writer writing to the German chancellor, but as our patron. And of course we were absolutely thrilled that she took on this role which she does with a huge amount of energy and, um, and also incredible contributions intellectually to the project and, um, and also fantastic texts that she writes and speeches which are quite rousing. It is important to understand what exile truly means. I'm sure this is going to be an issue that people are interested in, the definition of exile. And this is our other patron, Joachim Gauck. Um, some of you, maybe all of you will recognize him, the former president of Germany from 2012 to 2017. 
a former pastor who came to prominence as a civil rights activist in East Germany. Throughout his career, his uh, freedom, democracy, and human rights were, have been central themes. And um, he came on board, I think, two years ago yeah. and um, began his, um, his initiation into the project with a fantastic gesture, which was when he turned 80, he said, no presents, just contributions to the Exile Museum, which was, um, gave a, a good in, a financial injection to the project. He says, why do we still need a museum that tells individual stories of Nazi era exile? I think the real question is, why did it take so long? Now, this is Bernd Schultz, who is the real initiator and also the main donor of this project. Um, and he is the co-founder and longtime managing director of Villa Griesebach, um, one of Germany's leading auction houses in Berlin on Fasanstrasse, some of you might know it, right next door to the Literaturhaus literatur and its famous cafe. And he, his motivation came from um, coming face to face again and again with the fate of German exile through his encounters with works of art, which left a lasting impression on him. And it was his idea to establish the Exile uh, Museum Foundation. And in 2018, he, 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 he did the amazing thing of auction, auctioning a large part of his private art collection and along with private donations secured a substantial part of the foundation's funds. Now he looks like a very friendly person here, which he is, but he's also an amazing, um, an amazing activist and somebody who is really driven by this vision and um, a fantastic enthusiast of others. Um, I think he writes um, maybe 100 letters a week, um, <laughs> trying to win people's support, getting people engaged. Um, and uh, yeah, he's really the driving force behind this initiative. And um, he, the, the person that he brought in to be the founding director of it is uh, Professor Dr. Christoph Stolzel, who um, is the founding director. He's a historian with a long career working on many important museum projects, including uh, the founding of the German Historical Museum in Berlin. He's a former politician and a cultural senator, and he was also instrumental in finding the new director of Berlin's Jewish Museum uh, last year. In 2010, he became president of the Franz Liszt Music Academy in Weimar. And in 2020, he was awarded the Bundesverdienstkreuz, the highest German um, order of merit for his contribution to culture and memorialization, memorialization work. And he is an amazing, um, I call him a, a sort of jukebox of stories because he <laughs> has the most incredible number of, of biographies and historical facts in his head. And um, we are always you know, trying to collect those and order them and, um, and remember them as well as he does. And here's a photo of the board and executive leadership. And um, it looks like a COVID picture, but it's not. It's, uh, it's, from, two, it's from last year, from winter last year, um, sunny but cold in Berlin. And we are standing in front of the Anhalter Bahnhof the, the portal, the ruin, the remaining ruin of what was once Berlin's largest, I believe, uh, passenger train station. And um, the, you can recognize already the two gentlemen in the center, uh, Christoph Stolzl and Ben Schulz, Cornelia Fossen, who's standing next to me, uh, sitting next to me, Michael Marie Thiele, our managing director, who is also on the call, and my colleagues on the board, um, Andre Schmitz, a former um, uh, cultural senator of Berlin and an, also an uh, amazing, um, uh, amazing um, communicator, communicator <laughs> and uh, sits on many, many boards and is uh, brilliant at dealing with the sort of municipal uh, bureaucracies <laughs> and, uh, and uh, finding a way through that and Kai Drabe, who's our colleague who takes care of all the finances and the legal stuff and um, is a huge support. And then I think you recognize the lady uh, in the blue. 
Okay, and a warmer, sunnier picture of the team in the office where we are right now. Um, it's, uh, yeah, as you can see, it's a six strong team here. And uh, with the emphasis on the strong, because they really do an amazing job. Team is led and advised by Christoph Stolzl, um, Cornelia Fossen, three scientific or academic researchers, rather, Sarah Blendin, Philip Suxdorf, and Dana Muller. Um, and competences in the field of XR research, exhibition concept, multimedia audio production, uh, interactive education. I mean, a, a huge, huge range of skills are brought together in a very, very small team who covered a huge um, amount of, of territory over the last few years that this initiative has been going. And there's Micah. Right, past and present, making milestones in the making of the museum and we've taken it from 2016 uh, because that's when Bernd Schultz had the idea right we've got to do this we've had the call from Herta Muller and he was immediately inspired by Stefan Moses the, the book of Stefan Moses photography which was put together by Christoph Stolzl. 2017 the foundation of the office uh, and I think you might recognize the, the background and the table. I, we can't see ourselves right now, but you, you can see that uh, yes. where we are. And, um, and also the idea for locating the museum at Anhalter Bahnhof, and I'll say a bit more about that in a second. Um, 2018, the legal establishment of the foundation. It says website and brochure here, uh, you know, hu huge undertakings done very successfully by the team. Um, parliamentary decision to grant the land. Um, 2019 announcement of the architectural competition, completion of the rough concept of the exhibition. And 2020 jury decision on the new building at Anhalter Bahnhof. Wow, that's, a, that's an absolute whistle stop tour <laughs> of what's happened so far. I, I'm sure that you can imagine that all of this has taken the most incredible amount of work. And um, I hope that you can get a little bit of a taste of the ambition that uh, runs um, through, throughout this project. Why Anhalter Bahnhof? Well, Anhalter Bahnhof is, as I said, was the largest station in Berlin. Um, all that's left of it is what you can see in the red circle. Um, if you go to, there is still an existing um, S-Bahn station there. And if you travel there, you'll see that it's a gigantic, has the most gigantic platform, um, totally um, uh, not in, not in, not in um, an appropriate relationship to the number of passengers who use it. It's a little bit of a wasteland at the moment, that, that site, although there are some key institutions there, like uh, the Tagesspiegel newspaper has its headquarters there. Um, you can see the Tempo Drome in the background and just behind the portal, on the right hand side, you can see there's a football pitch, which um, is a very, very, very popular place um, for kids uh, from the um, local municipality, which is Kreuzberg, who often come from migrant backgrounds. It's, a, it's really the heart of the community in that sense that uh, families come there and watch their kids playing football. And it's nice to, uh, for us, it's an exciting venture to have these two worlds coming together. Here you can see at the bottom also um, the picture of people saying goodbye and their last moments uh, leaving home. Here you can see starting 1933, countless individuals leaving Berlin. So of course for us really important because it's an authentic site. We had considered other locations in the city, but I think it was Christoph Stolz yeah. had the idea and the moment he had the idea, there was absolutely no going back on it. <laughs> Um, the, the portico ruin remains as a symbol of setting forth, making a decisive break and transit. And the question that remained for us after we've got through the bureaucracies of trying to secure um, the lease of the land was how do we incorporate this ruin, uh, which is not of architectural significance, but of course uh, some has historic significance into a new building. So this is the plan, just a quick run through because Cornelia will be saying much more, a purpose-built museum at Anhalter Bahnhof in the center of Berlin. 
biographical narratives providing perspective on exiles from 1933 to 45, and really importantly, building a bridge for the present day. A planned 1,600 square meter multimedia exhibition and 400 meter square meters temporary exhibition space. And in case it hasn't sunken in yet, I think I should say it now, that the idea behind this museum is that it does not have a permanent collection or a object-based collection. It's really about telling the stories using multimedia. And there you go. <laughs> um, partnerships with in institutions engaged in researching, collecting and exhibiting exile stories. And the museum as a showcase and platform. So the, the plan, for the idea behind the Exile Museum is a like a shop front where stories will be told. It's not going to be an institution which does a huge amount of research um, or, 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 as I said, collecting of objects. It's really a showcase and a way of getting people engaged in the subject, making it real. So building the museum, this is sort of looking into the future. So that's that photo is under COVID circumstances. So you can see the jury is very spread out in a huge space that Micah managed to find. 2021, define the project structure for construction and contract the architect. And uh, I think we have a couple of architects in the audience uh, today, so you'll know what this uh, involves. Finalization of agreement with local council and uh, building a community support for the project as well as ongoing fundraising. 2022 to 24, start building on the site, detailed concept of the exhibition, the commissioning, the operational concept. And there we go, 2025 planned opening. <laughs> a little sketch of it. So these are the participants of the architectural competition. And um, I'm going to rest for a second on this slide because those of you who know about our contemporary architecture will see some really, really impressive names on this list. We were supported in this process by um, the brilliant Kristin Freireis, who runs the AIDIS Gallery and Centre here in Berlin, who um, has a fantastic international network of architects who she has worked with and shown their work and published their work. And um, it was really under her uh, leadership that we came up with this name of list of architects who all submitted and you can see that it's um, it's extremely international and um, and star studded. Um, uh, three prizes first prize uh, winner went was went to Dörte Mantrup, a woman architect based in Copenhagen. Second prize went to Dilla and Scafidio uh, based in New York, so many of you will know their, their Highline project. And third prize to Bruno Fioretti Marquez, based between Berlin and Lugano. And here's Dörte Mandrup, our winning architect. Danish architecture studio uh, set up in Copenhagen in 1999, specializing in cultural buildings and mixed use projects internationally recognized for creating architecture with a strong sense of place. Of course, that was very important to us and unique sense of materiality. Practice portfolio holds five cultural buildings in UNESCO protected sites. And Mantrup is, a, is part of the 2021 RIBA Honours Committee. And she herself is a recipient of numerous honours, including the Berlin Art Prize from the Academie der Künste here in Berlin in 2019. And here are some pictures of the her plan. And um, although I wasn't on the jury myself, I love this design. Um, and I'm going to show you a few pictures uh, because I feel that it um, it gives the the ruin. Uh, it, it honors the ruin. It gives it space. It's um, it has real presence, but also a lightness about it. And um, it, uh, I think it will very quickly become a, a have a kind of a symbolic image whilst being also a practical building. I think that's it from my side. Oh, here's a couple of more pictures. Yeah, here you see some, um, some visualizations of the interior, also um, the um, visitor center and, uh, and also the envelope of the building. 
and, um, and another um, an image that shows the um, vaults and arches and how they are incorporated. So that's all from me, but before I hand over to Cornelia, I'd like to make a couple of, uh, a, a few general points as well as some personal points. So um, even though this, our title was billed as a mu exile museum for Berlin, it is not for Berlin. We feel that it is for the world. It's a story of two halves. It's a story of German speaking lands and it is a story of um, the experiences that people had when they went out into the world in these very difficult circumstances. It's also the story of, um, uh, it's also uh, at its heart, it's dedicated to unearthing human stories that hide behind cold statistics. And um, it also had in its heart a desire to communicate or to find new ways to communicate to future generations um, some of the unbelievable stories of survival. The idea of the museum is not to step on anybody's toes, but to really coalesce, bring, um, create partnerships between existing institutions and fill a space that we are convinced exists and our partners are convinced exists. And, um, and one final word for me, this has been an amazing experience because I moved to Germany in 2012. And um, for me being involved in this museum has also been the story, my personal story of integration into a new country. I became um, a German national uh, last year. And, um, and I can remember my first board meetings, I could barely follow what was being said. <laughs> and, um, and so, uh, you know, so the, 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 this whole notion of arriving in a new country and, and the challenges of, um, of, of, of understanding or being understood um, is something that I feel have felt very closely. And, um, and I can say that not only is it a great honor to participate in this event today, but I'm also so happy that I don't have to do it in German. <laughs> Over to you. So, so now you. I have the problem to top Ruth, who is a native speaker and I'm not, and I hope you will forgive, but I try my best. So the concept. Again, Hertha Müller, our beloved Petrum, is our starting point because she, she gave two interviews, which for me as a curator, we really were ins very inspiring. And I, I, can, I want to show you in which way. In the first interview, she said, nowhere in, his, in this country is the meaning of the word exile really illustrated in the context of individual stories. The risks of leaving the unsettled and bewildering nature of life and exile, the alienation, fear and homesickness. A museum devoted to the subject of exile would allow younger Germans to imagine the experience for themselves and thus to develop compassion and empathy. And in the second interview, she said, the focus of the exile museum should be exile in the context of Nazi Germany. This was an unprecedented catastrophe for those who were persecuted and lost everything and a catastrophe for Germany, which expelled its most important artists and its best scientists within a very short period of time. But this period, of course, also draws attention to the refugees who are now finding their way to us. That makes it all the more important to understand what exile truly means. We really put this text into its pieces and made an abstract out of it. Meaning of the word exile really illustrated in the context of individual stories for us means biographies are in the center of our work. The risks of leaving the unsettled and bewildering nature of life and exile, the alienation, fear and homesickness is the path of exile. I will later on tell you what it is. The focus of the Exil Museum should be exile in the context of Nazi Germany. Our focus is on exile during Nazi era. But this period, of course, also draws attention to the refugees who are now finding their way to us. That makes it all the more important to understand what exile truly means. So, of course, we want to have a strong reference to the present. If you put this all together into one mission statement by Christoph Stölzel, it is the Exil Museum Berlin, a place of unforgettable stories, 
a place of reflection, a place of empathy, a place that fosters understanding of the word exile, and in doing so takes a stand against total, to, totalitarianism <laughs> and inhumanity. So our mission is, we want to focus on the history of exile. We have a strong biographic narrative. We want to stress the quality of the authentic site at Anhalter Bahnhof. And um, of course, we want to be, uh, we want to have a strong reference to actuality and relevance. Um, one way to have a very near and close close up view to the biographies will be media and if i'm talking about media it's really about large sized media like you can see them on the picture these are of course only examples um, but this is this is our way to to um, yeah to focus on these biographies and the second slide we want to also to work with the room. What you see now is not abstract art, but um, our drawings we made very, <laughs> not very professional, <laughs> but this is our way, way to really develop the rooms and to, to, to use the room to narrate the story. And here we, we will stay for a while. Um, I give you a quick overview over the exhibition space. It starts um, at the bottom in the entrance, you, you enter the building and then you can um, see the history of the place, Anhalter Bahnhof, which is entry, free of entry. So um, you get an inspiration about the place where you are and all, hopefully are so much inspired that you buy a ticket <laughs> and go into the first room. <coughs> Um, which uh, is um, some sort of linear tour following the, the stations very roughly you, you undergo if you go into exile. So it starts with the century of exile. It's, it's some sort of introductory room um, with a um, big media installation starting from the present and then zo zooming back to the Nazi area where we also want to explain why we focus on, on that time. In the second room, we have snapshot 1930, where we introduce people um, who only a few years afterwards are persecuted and have to leave the country. In the third room, um, it, it, uh, it deals with the expulsion. Um, the room number four is in transit. So this is quite an emotional room um, where we want to focus on the experience of being away from your home country but not having arrived yet and all flight stories that that are on this way um, in room number five where two uh, we we have a, a big map dealing with the networks the flight routes who is helping you on your flight who hinders you um, things like that room number six is two new worlds so what's happening in the foreign country? Is it possible to arrive? And how, how does the stories proceed? In room number seven, snapshot 1955 um, is about remigration. Do people come back and why do people come back? Room number eight is also a com um, comparable to in transit, some sort of retarding moment uh, in the exhibition. Room for discourse and resonance is a collection of interviews with uh, contemporary witnesses, um, experts, historians, philosophers, who think about, in interviews, think about um, uh, exile in Nazi era and put it into a pers perspective to present day. So this is the ideal bridge to the next room, number nine, which is Exile Today, which we want to develop together with partner institution working in that field. Um, and of course, we will have a large room for museum education. I think this is really important for this kind of museum. And we will have a, a 400 square meter space for a temporary exhibition because we also want to serve as a platform for other institution exchange exhibition and things like that. And the most important thing, thing you can find in the middle, it's the bioscope. And on, on, um, in, as a, on the outside, you can see the path of exile. These are the two rooms 
I will show you closer now. The bioscope is a space of about 200 square meter. It's the center, the core and the heart of, you, of the museum. It's planned as a cinema with a 160 degree screen and comfortable seating accessible from two different floors. And it's the museum biographical treasury. In here, um, the visitors find biographical stories in form of films, audio pieces, short documentaries, all kinds of forms of narration. Um, and um, the biographies here are not narrated according to a thematic focus, like in the other rooms, um, but they stand for themselves. And our goal is to, to create here a close-up view on single biographies and their inherent power to be experienced in, in a cinema-like atmosphere. The path of exile is a which it, uh, this path goes through nearly all rooms around the bioscope. It's a loose, non-linear sequence of cabinets presented in nearly all exhibition rooms, uh, which offer an independent tour through the museum. Light motifs like rootedness, things of exile, waiting, past, identity, language, etc., explore the universal experience of exile, the overall theme of the Exile Museum. Each cabinet illuminates one motif with the help of customized sonography as well as suitable literary quotes of exile authors then and now. Okay. That was a quick go through um, to the concept. I think if you have more questions, we can clear them afterwards. Uh, we also thought about the audience. If we compare our museums, for example, with the Jewish Museum in Berlin, then the experience is at the Jewish Museum that 77% um, um, of the first time visitors come from ab abroad and 25 of them um, visit the museum as a guided group. Our goal is to attract uh, visitors, adults and children also from Germany and Berlin and encourage multiple visits. Our main target group among non-tourists are migrants and people with migration background, especially because 70% of the residents around Anhalter Bahnhof are from immigrant families. And um, the idea of the museum education is that it's based on outreach with expert educational staff in um, inter intercultural dialogue and our own migration experience. Um, for the next spring, we plan a container project at Anhalter Bahnhof, which will allow participation in the project. Um, exemplarily, primarily we, we also want to show our partnership approach. Um, we are working there with architecture students from Berlin's Technical University to develop and build temporary um, exhibition installation out of residential containers designed to um, accommodate refugees. And we work with the Körber Stiftung, maybe you know them. They, for example, do the Days of Exile, I think every two years here in Germany, and the We Refugees Archive to develop content and events with us. Fundraising. The Exile Museum is a private initiative. Uh, initiative. All funds come from private, private sources and donate, as donations. Bernd Schulz, whom, whom uh, Ruth also already introduced, provided a critical initial infusion to the foundation by selling his graphic art collection and donating the proceeds worth um, 6.5 million euros. The building will cost around seven, uh, 27 million. Expected overall budget is 50 million euros. In addition, annual, annual operating costs it will be around uh, 1.5 to 2 million. And a similar private initiative to rebuild the Berliner Schloss here in Berlin has raised 105 million. So we hope it will work out, uh, but we have to say, I think it took decades of years <laughs> uh, to, to raise this. Um, what are the challenges and how can you help to build the Exim Museum? We are collecting biographies. The expellees themselves are the protagonists embodying the history of exile. 
So images, audio, video, written text, historical and modern objects, scenography and media installation, live stories are vividly brought to life. Our goal is to find as many different as approaches as possible to biographies of famous and unknown people and find creative ways to tell their stories even if picture material is missing. All help is welcome by you <laughs> in finding picture material, especially about unknown people with interesting stories. The second thing is, Ruth mentioned it before, we, we don't have a collection. We are not able and don't want to build up a bigger own collection, but to work in par partnership with existing institutions engaged, engaged in researching, collecting and exhibiting exile. The museum is a platform and showcase for all of them. The advantage is the conception can be developed independently from the collection that needs to be presented. This allows for the intended close-up view of the topic using a narrative which is based on media and scenography. And this is how you could help us. We are interested in all kinds of cooperations and donors of treasures of photography and film. Ah, oh, sorry, that was it. <laughs> Um, the next topic, topic and a challenge for us is the bridge to exile today. Um, for us, it's important to understand the impact on individual and groups of exile and forced migration, as it, this is the central mission of the Exile Museum. We want to examine the basic causes and effects of migration worldwide. This part of the museum will be developed in cooperation with the refugees, agencies, and partner institutions with migration experience. And we are very welcome on all thoughts on this. And um, we work with contemporary witnesses. Uh, at the moment, we, we feel it's the last chance to talk to contemporary witnesses. The room for discourse and resonance will be a forum with life-size projections. Interviews will be extracts from interviews with contemporary witnesses, historic, historians, uh, I told that before. And we are very grateful for suggestions of interesting interview partners. And of course, um, we, although we already raised 12 million, it will be still a Herculean task to collect the necessary funds from private donors. The restrictions imposed by COVID-19 have made this task hopefully only temporary, even more difficult. So all creative ideas are very welcome. So why an Exil Museum? This is why we, I show you now as um, to close the presentation and interview with um, Georg Stefan Troller. He was, um, he was a 1938 refugee and he was the first person we interviewed for this project. And he was traveling with his 97 years to Berlin and we were very much impressed by him as a personality and by what he thought. So why an exile museum? Die Tatsache ist, dass obwohl ich jetzt schon 100 Mal in Deutschland war und obwohl ich in einem halben Jahrhundert für Deutschland arbeite, mir nie irgendjemand eigentlich gefragt hat, wie war es denn dort drüben im Exil, ja? Und nie irgendjemand gesagt hat, es tut mir furchtbar leid, äh, Ich stehe hier für alle und sage ihnen, wir bedauern, was ihnen passiert ist oder so etwas ähnliches. Ja? Das ist ja nie passiert. Das Eigentliche unserer Emigration wurde zwar von unseren Autoren immer wieder aufgearbeitet, ja? ist aber nicht Teil, sagen wir mal, der deutschen Psyche geworden. Und das war das, was mich von Anfang an äh, verwundert und, und verstört hat, dass die Leute gar nicht mehr wussten, wie es oder wissen wollten, wie es sich eigentlich angefühlt hat im Exil. Okay. So, thank you very much. I close the presentation now and we are happy to answer questions. Well, uh... Thank you, thank you so much, um, Ruth and uh, Ruth and um, Caroline. Uh, 
Cornelia, that was a really fascinating presentation. So thank you very much for this. Um, how this will work with the question is that we ask you all to type the questions into the chat. And Monica Bumdushen, she will uh, read them in a minute. So uh, you might need a bit of time still for typing. So please uh, do so now. Uh, I'm really fascinated by the whole project. Um, and I thought I start with a, a question uh, while everybody else is typing. And that is one of terminology. Let's start with at the beginning, why call it Exil Museum? Now you uh, you noticed when um, Michael was introducing me, he was talking uh, about uh, various organizations I'm part of, and yes, they are called the Gesellschaft für Exilforschung or the Research Center for Exile Studies. But really, uh, this talk is in connection with the Association of Jewish Refugees, and generally we talk about refugees. So why was the how was the decision made to call the museum Exil Museum, or rather than yeah? Refugee. Very good question. We are still struggling on that. <laughs> um, it, it was funny. It was funny because I was against that name. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, Christoph Stertl now, if you would sit here, he would say it's important that it tells the, the visitors very quickly what it is, is it about. And uh, for him, a museum nowadays is a place uh, of encounter and not so much a, a place of presenting a collection. So, so this is his definition. And um, the, the thing is, if you have a name, once you have a name, <laughs> it stays the name. <laughs> okay, okay. That, 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 is, that is a very interesting question. I wonder whether other people have uh, views on that as well, but I don't want to you know, dominate the proceedings. That would be unfair. Um, um, Monica, are there any questions you would like to start off with? Right, well, perhaps I can sort of assume the prerogative and, and actually ask the first one myself on the back of the uh, important issue that, that Andrea has just introduced. Yes. It's all very well, I think, to say you you know you choose a name, Exile Museum. It sounds good, it sounds convincing, but it does actually raise some really crucial questions, doesn't it, for your endeavor? Um, it seems to me, I mean, it was telling that at some point, I can't remember exactly the context, but the word homesickness was used. Now, perhaps I should start from an entirely personal point of view. Both my parents, my father was actually from Poland, my mother from a German-speaking Lithuanian family, um, they didn't want to go back, and I think that will hold true. I think you know this. It's very obvious that for the vast majority of those who were forced to flee, the notion of a kind of homesickness, let alone actual homecoming, was banished forever by what the Nazis perpetrated. Yes, and I don't want to be heavy handed about this. I know the intentions are very good, but it does seem to me that it is a contentious term. So I wonder if you would like to kind of reply perhaps in a little bit more detail. So um, did I understand your question right that you that you I don't know if I really... Okay, um, sorry, I didn't, I didn't speak too, too, too fast. No, no, it's fine. It just seems to me, it's hard to know what a better term might be, a refugee museum. Ah, okay. Maybe okay. not. No, but the point is that for, and I speak as somebody who, you know, um, is the child of refugees who came here just in time, but who were eternally grateful to this country for taking them in. Do you see? Yeah. So, so it's not exile for people like my parents and for many people, the offspring probably mostly here tonight. Um, it, what it's a different experience. It's not, it's exile presupposes homesickness, the wish to go back home. And that wish, if you like, was robbed. You know, it was, was taken away by the Nazis, what they did. But, but what, we, what we always experience, also if people feel that they have a new home country in a foreign country, they feel this kind of homesickness. So um, it's complicated in, in a lot of in a lot of ways, and I think it it stays some sort of. It's also was what um, Mr. Troller told us. It, it there is some sort of loss of, of identity. Although you are maybe happy in the new country, um, there is some sort of yeah schizophrenic. I would nearly say um, at loss of identity. I mean, each story, each individual will react differently. There are no sort of blanket um, generalizations, but I do think it's it's a term that needs to, and I hope you will do it in your displays, in the way you present the material, you need to, you know, kind of encourage people to think about the complexities of the very term. Yes? Yeah. Yes. I think 
I think so, the definition of exile is also that people were forced to leave. So that was not an emigration, it, it was exile. And um, yeah, it was not their own decision. Yeah. I, what I find a little bit more difficult about the name Exile Museum is that it rises an expect expectation that so you, you don't really know as a visitor uh, that it's focusing on Nazi era. Exile could be more. And I mean, we, we tried, we, we will bridge in a way, but we can't talk about all exiles during all centuries. I, I mean, it's just not possible. So our idea is more to, to see Nazi era as a model. I mean, it, it, by numbers, it was um, an exile with, with not so many people, but I think it has some sort of um, model character for other exiles. And this is what we want to stress, that we focus on the experience of exile. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, what I meant to say before I started off the question um, was that we also have Maike Marie Thiele with us, uh, who's an expert in exhibition and museum design. Uh, and she has been involved in many museums in Berlin, Leipzig, Zurich and uh, Fürth. And she's the managing director of the Stiftung, so of the foundation. Uh, XD Museum that obviously is supporting the XD Museum. So she's here as well. So she, you can ask uh, questions and she might answer some of your questions. But um, have we got more questions? We certainly um, do. Is it surprising? Yes. Of course not. No, uh, no, no, indeed. I'm just wondering where best to start. Um, some quite kind of practical ones, others more conceptual. Um, perhaps starting with one from Shunam Baer of the Courtauld Institute, or formerly of the Courtauld. Um, would the museum encompass the very controversial debates of the so-called inner and external exile of the 1940s and 50s? So uh, I read the question, uh, of course, um, Austria, Czechoslovakia and Hungary is included. So it's the German speaking exile um, from Nazi era. And um, in the room snapshot 1955, we will also uh, focus on um, um, exile from the GDR to Germany, and um, but we we cannot we cannot go until the 60s or 70s. There will be maybe a quick overview, but not it will not be in focus. Okay. Okay. So so and and, and about inner exile, inner emigration, will there be? A Will yeah. there be any any? Uh, will you deal with this this specific uh, era? We will have a, a big media installation at the beginning of the room, a snapshot 1955, which deals with the um, great controversy controversy okay. <laughs> um, controversy <laughs> controversy. Yeah. Thomas Mann and the others. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Have we, uh, what else have we got? Yes, indeed. Um, right, here's one from Julia Eisner. Um, how will the Exil Museum relate or distinct relate to or distinguish itself from the Jewish Museum? No, that's a very interesting question. Who who wants to who, who wants to answer answer that? Cornelia yeah, so or, or, or Ruth? <laughs> we interrupted because uh, we were running out of power, but the problem is solved now. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm so glad, you know, that in Berlin you're running out of power. You always think it's a complete shambles in the UK what we're doing, but yes. Now, uh, yeah, I know the feeling, it happens at universities as well, when it's after a certain time they switch off the light. Um, so, yes, the question focused, um, um, yeah, who would like to answer, uh, answer this question? Can you repeat the question, please? Yes, the relationship, um, yes, the question about how um, the, your project is going to distinguish itself from the Jewish Museum in Berlin. Yes, of course we will. I mean, I mean, yeah, of course, I mean. <laughs> but how, but how? <laughs> the, the Jewish Museum has one room about exile, but it's, it's, it's just one room among many, many others. And, and our, I think um, our idea is really to, to put to, to, to fill this gap, um, because a lot of museums, like Ruth told before, um, have one room on exile, but not a whole exhibition, so there's no stress on that. Also in the documentary center, which will be, um, which will open um, next year, they also have one small area, exhibition area to deal with it, but I think it's really it, it remained in the shadow of, of the reception of Holocaust. 
And um, yeah, I think a lot of people, even, even for example, Christoph Stelzel, who is really uh, like, how did you say? A jukebox of stories. <laughs> Um, it, it's really fantastic. We make we, um, every day we make so many new um, findings of new stories. I mean, Monica, I think you, as you will know as yourself, how how far um, and how rich um, this field is. So just to add, it's also it's not just telling about the Jewish experience. There are also non-Jewish stories yeah. of exile. So that makes yeah. it also quite unique. Yeah. And. And also very different from the Jewish Museum. Okay. Well, that would have been my next question. Would have been how I'm sure you must have had debates. Uh, are you going to have a, a sort of numerical distribution? You know, uh, or how how are you going to deal with uh, with the question of, of of Jewish refugees and and those who did not define themselves as Jewish or those who were indeed Gentiles, non-Jewish? Have you had? Can you tell us a bit more about these debates? within the museum maybe i mean i mean i think we have to we have to face the fact that 90 percent of the emigres were jewish and 10 percent were from a political background but of course um we are interested in all these kinds of stories and want to give a to give a full picture of people who were persecuted okay um Andrew, if I can, yes, yeah. just interject there. And um, there are several questions all very much on the same theme um, about an organization, which I must confess, I know virtually nothing about the Museum de, de Freiburg. Um, is there a reason why they would, hold on, no, no, that's not the best. Um, yes, are you cooperating with that Stiftung? And is there any danger of overlap or indeed room for cooperation? No, we are in a good contact with them. It's uh, the director is Gundula Bavendam. And um, we, we are certainly, um, we, we, uh, talk, we talked about uh, both con concepts and I think it will be a perfect match. So it's now overlapping. Can you tell us a little bit more about that organization for those of us who don't know enough? It's, um, it's, uh, I don't know the English name. In German it says no. Dokumentationszentrum Flucht, Vertreibung, Versöhnung. So it's flight, uh, persecution, reconciliation, yeah, exactly. I think. No. <laughs> and, and I think in English, if I can interject that in English, these people are called expellees and that's the difference refugees and expellees you you use the term expellees but i think if we look at it i mean certainly in academia from the outside we would call people um that that expellees but yeah please please um do 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 uh expand because i don't think that is so well known in the uk yeah so, so, but it, it deals with the flight from the Eastern, uh, maybe, maybe you can explain. I think, Andrea, you are the better person for that. <laughs> My English uh, is it. <laughs> well, it, it does deal with the, with the uh, expulsion of uh, people of German, German descent from the Eastern territories that used to be part of the German Reich. And then obviously after the end of the Second World War were not part. Of, of Germany anymore. And, and obviously a lot of people were forcibly um, forced to basically uh, flee, move and were persecuted as well. And there's, there's also, um, the, well, there's a foundation that, that wants to establish a museum uh, a, a, as well. And obviously there are, I would say it's, it's, they're quite distinct areas, but on the other hand, uh, there are clearly connections. And as you said, that, um, that, that you are, cooperating and uh, not not least them. also geographical connections because it yeah. will also be at Anhalter Bahnhof so just across the road from the planned exile museum and how, how far advanced is that project is it quite embryonic still it, it's um it's opening next year oh, okay. after I think 11 or 12 years <laughs> working on that um and but they are all very happy that we will join this because uh, in a way there's also um, topography of terrors nearby, Jewish museums nearby. So uh, what we developed there is some sort of new museum island. So it's with a Cluster, focus yeah. on the theme. Yeah. Now I see there's somebody called Nick Courtman who actually was asking a question about this other organization. Nick, you're obviously keen to say something. Let me unmute you, or at least try to, and uh, do keep it brief if you wouldn't mind, but go, go ahead. Thanks. Sorry for being overly keen on that. No, um, I, was, I was just going to say um, I remember a few years ago, the Fluchvertreibung Versöhnung actually did a kind of preview exhibition at the German Historical Museum, where they also made a very big point of drawing 
um, comparisons between the experiences of displaced ethnic Germans from the former parts of the Deutsches Reich, but also from other parts of Eastern and Central Europe, and displaced German Jewish refugees from Germany who had to leave during the National Socialist period. And what I found was also sometimes a slightly ethically problematic mm -hmm. manner, which collapsed really significant qualitative historical differences between the experiences of those different groups. Yeah. And I mean, the point that those museums are going to be in such close historical, you know, spatial proximity, I think is significant, but it's also difficult to try and extricate that spatial proximity from attempts for a certain agents in a German political system to also kind of bring the experiences of German Jews and German victims of persecution as Germans into into proximity to each other. So I was just wondering whether you can maybe say a bit more on, you know, you're saying that there's going to be some good cooperation between the two organizations, but the kind of proximity of the Bund der Vertriebenen to Fluchtvertreibungsversorgung is also a little bit worrying <laughs> from my personal perspective. So I was just wondering if there'd also been some discussion on how one's going to draw out the really important differences between those two different institutions and historical periods or experiences or events that they're going to be engaging with. I think it will be also a question of temporary exhibitions to work this out and maybe to we also already talked with Mr. Mrs. Bavendam about um, doing maybe partner exhibitions so at the same time to to distinguish between both. Mm. Excellent. Well, I, I think that's, um, well, that is, we, we just have to visit and see, won't we? But uh, yes. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it is a very important question. I, and I, I think I, I share some of those um, reservations. Um, can we maybe have some questions more about the, the concept, the conceptual? Indeed, uh, aspect no, I was going to say, museum. let's let's move on to some, to shift the focus slightly. Um, yes, from somebody called Karen, um, which museums elsewhere have inspired your approach to content and presentation? Do you have any kind of models that you are keeping well in mind? <laughs> That's a funny question. <laughs> Uh, it's a good point, I think, but um, uh, the origin of the museum, in fact, was, uh, I, it, it, it sounds a little bit stupid now, but the origin, in fact, was an exhibition that Christoph Stössl and me made uh, in 2016 about Harry Graf Kessler, which um, was, um, was some sort of messianic person uh, writing a lot of diaries um, in, in the time around the uh, around the uh, 19th, 20th century, and he was examining the, um, the, the change into modernism. And um, I, that, that uh, was the time I was meeting Christoph Stölzl, and um, the, different, the difficult thing was to, how can we put the diaries, written diaries, like I think one meter of diaries, into an exhibition room. And um, the answer was, was to work with media. So um, we made some sort of media installations which work as a kaleidoscope, um, which, which gives the visitor an insight into the world, world and pictures that Harry Graf Kessler saw at his time, mixed up with audio um, quotes from the diaries. And this is what Bernd Schulz, our initiator, saw and he said, ah, that's the idea how we can develop the XC Museum because he, he very much liked this kind of close view. And it's also a way to have a strong narrative without having a, a known uh, collection. Okay. Right. So, so this is how it comes. Just Thank picking you. up on that, I was struck by the mention several times of the word scenography. And I wonder, I can see where you're coming from, what, you know, at least in theory, you're trying to achieve. But I wonder if there's also perhaps a danger of adopting an over theatrical approach to the material. And I'm sure again, I'm sure you've thought about these things. And it's important yeah. to think of them in advance. But I wonder if you have any thoughts. No, we don't want to have a, a Disney exhibition. No, I hope not. <laughs> um, Oh, if we are working, it's it's. But I think it's um, if you nowadays work with modern exhibitions, you find very decent ways of of working uh, with with the room. It's, it doesn't say that we want to uh, um, ins insinuate. How do we say ins um Stage. Uh, stage. Put it on stage. Mm -hmm. But um, like for example, the Auswandererhaus Bremerhaven does. They really have puppets 
um, queuing in front of a ship which leads the emigrant to the new world and things like that. This is not what we intend to do. So the, the idea is more to work with um, media and interactive ex exhibits. And um, for example, in the, in the bioscope, it's not a normal cinema, it's, it's, it's a 160 degree cinema so that we really can work with the space. And a question from Rachel Dixon. Um, how do you envisage making partnerships with international organizations and other, you know, other museums? I think that's an interesting and important question. Uh, uh, networking at the moment is 50% of my job. <laughs> <laughs> and I would love to work more on the exhibition, and <laughs> less on the networks, <laughs> I have to admit. But uh, um, for example, we may also make presentations at the um, Botschaft, uh, the, the embassy. The embassy. embassy and, um, we are in good connection with all these kinds of countries, have, having ambassadors in Germany and... Um, yeah, there was, there was, um, I mean, um, Cornelia and Christopher obviously giving a lot of talks and, um, and meeting people as they come through Berlin, but last year there was quite a significant event that took place here at the German Foreign Ministry. Was it last year? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, where there was a presentation to ambassadors from relevant countries. So both, both ambassadors from relevant countries posted to Germany, but also German ambassadors posted overseas to relevant countries yeah. to, to make sure there's the reciprocal element and, um, and, um, and a request uh, to, you know, to share material and make partners in those countries aware of the initiative. And actually the response has been phenomenal. Yeah. Um, we've had a lot of interest. And um, of course, as people have been coming through Berlin, they've also been coming into the office here. And there are a lot of people, single people who just um, now saw the, new, the building we plan and to, who bring their stories themselves. So this is, this is also a big part of our work. Okay, so you are approachable by individuals. If, if someone wants to come and see you and, and wants to share a particular story, how, how, how does that work? Can people really just drop in? Uh, how does it work? <laughs> we also had that. <laughs> but in fact, uh, most of the time it's going over email. Okay. Yes, I have a number of questions here precisely along those lines. How do we approach you? You know, yes, how, how to set about it. Um, in fact, and here, apropos that, um, uh, Gillian Dare, if you're particularly focusing on the 1933 to 45 period, you must be racing against time to collect stories given the age of the protagonists. Have you formed partnerships with other organizations around the world who have already collected such stories? And of course, one example is the wonderful Refugee Voices archive that Bea Lefkowitz, who I hope is in the audience today from the AJR, has, has amassed over the years so tell us more about that no i think the well i mean i, I there have been some initial conversations but of course the idea is to cooperate and um initial uh, there have been initial meetings and um it's quite a long road ahead now but um over the next couple of years of course that's i think that's going to be the priority for the museum is pinning down those partnerships so that as I said, the, the idea of the Exile Museum is this incredible showcase and not about necessarily creating the own, the material ourselves. And for us, oh, as, I, as I told us, it's really important to, um, to find the photographs and the films and this is what we are focusing on because you, you all will know, I think that the field of Exile research is huge. And I think um, it's not a problem to read all these books you, <laughs> you see behind us. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really difficult to, to decide what, to, what we cannot show and what we will show. And, and it's all very much depending on the material we find. So what yes. extent will it be a rotating display? Because there are various questions which are asking, you know, how much room is there for how many stories? Yes, so that's, I think, quite an important question. Yeah, I, I, um, yeah, we are still working on that question. We have a, um, a short list of 150, but there is another list of 1,000. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's still a process. I cannot say how many will be in the end. Um, it's also a question of costs and of finances. Mm -hmm. For example, if, I think we are good if in the bioscope we produce for the opening 50 films, but that's a lot and it, it all has to be paid and uh, we have to find out what's 
that's what we can do. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I mean, I think this is really the, the, the advantage of media that of course we will have some sort of, we now fill a, a database and of course the visitors will have access to this database in the end in the museum. Um, so also, although we, we cannot show all biographies in extent, there will be a chance to to make um, own research in this okay. Well, that's that's very interesting for us as well. Unfortunately, I mean, this has been absolutely fascinating. Our time is also limited, so I think we will have to we will have to have two more questions, Monica, and then we oh, really have to. Well, draw. one very oh. practical one from somebody who I suspect is a filmmaker or something similar, Anke. Um, yes, Ruth and Cornelia said the foundation was open to creative suggestions. When is the best time to contact them uh, for companies and freelancers specialising in digital storytelling, documentaries, etc. Anytime, yes, I assume. Yes, up. <laughs> yes, Everybody can write to us. Okay, <laughs> fine. Um, we should mention, of course, the website, which is a mine of information with, of course, contact details. And perhaps, yes, one last question, which um, brings together various questions from different people. This issue, terribly important, clearly we'll all agree, uh, of how to bring past and present into a fruitful kind of relationship. Can you be a little bit more specific about the ways in which you're planning to proceed? Our, our first approach is to work in a similar way like um, like we do it in the exhibition so that is that we also want to show biographies in this room and also want to prolong the path of exile and then from the perspective of uh, modern ex exiles um, but as i said before we are, we want to develop the concept together with partner institutions so so we are quite open in that air, still in that area, and we want to be open because um, it's a process. Okay, well, excellent, excellent. Thank you, thank you so much. I mean, that was absolutely fascinating. I mean, I would have asked another sort of provocative question that would have been: We've had such a good talk, and we've had a wonderful number of attendants to this talk. Um, do we actually still need a physical museum? Should we just meet on the time online? No, I mean, yes, that would have that would have been my question, but I'm not even going to ask it because we're going to run out of time, and and, and I'm I'm sure we can continue this this discussion sometime, and maybe you you come back, maybe you give us an update when when you're a bit closer. That I think would be very much appreciated uh, by everybody at the AGR and and just, just one quick sentence. We, do, we definitely need the physical space. I mean, when Hertha Müller write, uh, wrote the letter to Angela Merkel, the answer was to develop um, a website which is mm. called um, Künste im Exil. Uh, mm. I think this is really not comparable. It's also a very nice mm. um, project, but it's not comparable to get to a place, to be physically in the room, to get one or two hours to concentrate on that. It's really different. I must admit, I, I, I agree, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to visiting as well. Okay, so we will come to a close now, and um, I would just like to invite uh, Ralf Tepe, who's the head of culture and education at the German embassy, to say a few words to conclude, and then Monica will, 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 uh, will conclude at the end. Ralf. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for giving me uh, a little voice at the end. Um, it was a fascinating um, presentation and discussion, and I think we uh, in the embassy are very glad that the uh, project of the Exile Museum in Berlin resonates so much with the public here in, uh, in the UK. And uh, um, I I'm sure it will continue to resonate and we wish this project uh, the best of luck and hopefully it will be completed in 2025. I think uh, the auspices are not too bad, even uh, the Berlin airport has been completed. Well, that took uh, a certain amount of time, but uh, uh, we hope it will not take uh, that long. And uh, from, uh, I think uh, I, I will be, as I will be moving uh, back to Berlin next year, will be very interesting to see uh, the project uh, grow. And uh, I would be uh, very much interested in, in 
uh, in the links that will be uh, um, that will be established from the, that the links between past and present. And uh, quoting our former federal president, he said, um, Miss, uh, "Mr. Garg said we should look with empathy on the destiny of uh, the exiled person." We should admire their gelebte Entschlossenheit, their lived de de determination. Mm. And I think if we turn that around, I think this is an exhortation to us. We're living now in a democratic uh, society and a democratic state to uh, that it will be our gelebte Entschlossenheit to grant exile to those who need it. And, and this, this kind of link and transformation, uh, I think, will be very important. And I, I'm very proud that we, for example, gave uh, exile and treatment to Mr. Navalny from Russia, who really needed help, and, and, and he got it. And, um, and so I hope that the museum will embody this kind of uh, spirit of, of granting exile and the importance of uh, yeah, looking, looking into our institutions and to see how we are able to help. That's definitely our intention. Thank you very much, Ralph, thank, and thank you for supporting this event. I will now pass over to Monica, who uh, will make some concluding remarks. Thank you for listening. Only, only very brief as the evening draws on. Um, yes, indeed, as many of you will know, um, the Insiders Outsiders Festival was my baby, as it were. Um, I initiated and became the director of it, a year long festival specifically intended to not only pay tribute, but actually to look in a more nuanced and possibly critical way at both the contribution of refugees from Nazi Europe to this country's culture, but also to the way that, well, the challenges they faced in and the complexities of the way in which they were received. It is not a simple story on the British side either, and I think that's really important. On the other hand, it is essentially a story of celebration. We're continuing with online events, as many of you will be aware, during lockdown and beyond, hopefully, now that the festival is officially finished. But there is, you know, as somebody else said earlier, such incredibly rich terrain, such extraordinary stories of resilience, creativity, determination, and many other things besides. So I suppose the Insiders Outsiders project is all about what Britain gained and what you are doing on one profound level is about what Germany lost. But I think we have in common, I mean, it's a kind of symbiotic relationship, I would suggest, but also we have in common, and I think this is absolutely crucial, uh, we share this, you know, almost it goes without saying, but the absolute conviction that the experiences of the past must be made relevant to the present day, particularly at a time of, you know, sort of ongoing refugee and immigrant issues in the world at large. So I think um, I will leave it there, except to say that for those of you who would like to listen to this wonderful session again, or tell friends and colleagues about it, it has been recorded, I do believe, and uh, the recording will be slightly edited and then um, uploaded both onto the um, Association of Jewish Refugees uh, YouTube channel and also the Insiders Outsiders one, probably, what should we say, within the week. Uh, so keep, keep looking. And um, well, a big thank you, Andrea, first of all, and indeed Michael and Alex at the AJR, and Ralph certainly, and most particularly to Ruth and to Cornelia, and indeed to Micah, who in the end didn't actually say anything, but <laughs> Micah and I had been in discussion about this project for a long time. But I do think now that you've got the architect, it's moving on to this next stage. It has been a very apposite moment in which to take stock, and I look forward to keeping in touch. And of course, last but not least, thank you to everybody, the many dozens of you who have listened in and uh, been such a responsive audience. Good night and be well. <laughs>